pull up uh, your Bible app, whichever you're using. Many of you may be familiar with a book that was written back in 1896. So you've had a, a long time to read it. Uh, so I don't think anything I say will be spoilers. Uh, I, I think over 100 years, it kind of forfeit uh, any uh, spoiler protection. But the book is written by Charles Sheldon. It's called In His Steps. And this book, In His Steps, is a fictional account of this town where people fall under conviction from the Lord, and they begin to conduct all of their lives under one basic question. What would Jesus do? And thus we now have bracelets and t-shirts and hats and all kinds of paraphernalia to make money on that question. But it all starts with this old book, In His Steps. So this community feels compelled to live their lives, whatever their occupation, whatever their lot in life, to live it always asking the question, what would Jesus do if Jesus were in my situation? And it's a great question to ask. It's a, a compelling book. It's a great read. Highly recommend it if you haven't read it. But it feels to me like in our day, we have so toyed with that question that we almost make Jesus do whatever we want him to do, rather than actually looking at Jesus and carefully considering how Jesus lived his life and how Jesus interacted with the world around him and allowing that to be our pattern. But this is the very idea that is addressed in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 18, where it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So a few things are obviously sticking out to you, and I'm not sure what, as I read that, maybe there were certain words or phrases that stood out to you, and I would encourage you to spend some time with the Lord and ask, you know, why did this stand out? Uh, this of all other parts of this passage, why did this verse, why did this phrase, why did this word stand out to me? But in verse 18, where it says, servants be subject to your masters with all respect. Now, slavery in this time, there are many facets that are different than how we understand the concept of slavery. In many cases, uh, what we have here are people who owe a debt that they can't pay. And so they offer themselves uh, for a term of service uh, to repay that debt, kind of a, a form of employment. But obviously, under that system, there are cases of abuse, and uh, there are a lot, that, a lot of things that could be said about that. But Paul's saying here, if you are in that position of servant, if you are in that position of slavery for whatever purpose, he says, be subject to your masters with all respect. He says, treat your master with respect. Don't hold a grudge against them. Don't be angry with them. Submit to them, subject yourselves to them with all respect, not only to the good ones, but also the gentle, the good and gentle, but also the unjust. So he's not saying as long as your master is nice to you, be nice to them. But if they're a jerk to you, it's okay to be a jerk to them. He says, no, regardless of how they act, regardless of how they treat you, treat them with respect. And he goes on in verse 19, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. And so he's saying in light of your knowledge of who God is, your awareness of God, you submit yourselves to walking in grace and love regardless of how you're treated. He says that there's going to be suffering, that it's very possible that this master is going to take advantage of you. 
If you are nice and gracious and kind, they may use that as reason to abuse you more, treat you more unjustly. But he says here that it's a gracious thing if this is the position you're put in. Whereas opposed to verse 20 where he says, for what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? So he's saying, look, if you're a jerk to your master and the master beats you because you're a jerk, there, there's no special grace from God for you. You're just being beaten because you're a jerk. You're just being beaten because you're rude. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Let me try to make this more practical for us in a way that hits a little closer to home. Let me just modify the language slightly. Employees, be subject to your boss, your employer with all respect. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are disciplined or punished for it, you endure. That's harder. Because that, that hits us where we live. That, that's a situation where you are trying to be a good Christian example in your workplace and imitate Christ and show the love of Christ and the grace of Christ and the mercy of Christ. And because of that, your employer or your supervisor or your boss mistreats you because of that because they know they can take advantage of you, because they know that you're not going to push back, they know that you're not going to resist, or they know that you're not gonna put up a fight, and so maybe they overlook you for promotions and give it to somebody less deserving. Or maybe because they just don't like religion, they just choose to mistreat you to see how far they can push you, how many of your buttons they can push before you snap. That's a harder scenario. But that's the scenario that Peter's addressing. When you are trying to live after the example of Christ and model Christ in your life, and because of that, people are mistreating you, they're being unjust to you, they're treating you differently because they know they can get away with it. He says this is when it's an act of grace. It's an act of grace when being mindful of God you allow yourself to be mistreated because you're following the example of Christ. And again, uh, following with what Peter's saying here, he's saying, look, if you're a Christian and you are the rudest employee at your workplace, if you are the most belligerent employee at your workplace, if you are the most stubborn employee or the laziest employee in your workplace, and your boss is not giving you promotions, overlooking you for raises, or just being nasty to you, Peter's like, that's on you. But if you are trying to walk in the steps of Christ, and because of that you're mistreated, it's a gracious thing in the sight of God. Or maybe we can make this even more practical. Maybe say, well, I haven't had a boss in years, and so I don't know what to do with that. What about when it's a neighbor or a friend who, because you're a Christian, because you're a goody two-shoes, because you're nice and gracious, they feel they can take advantage of you. They feel they can do whatever they want because you're not going to cause any trouble. <coughs> Peter says there's a grace. Because those are the moments when we are prone to say, I deserve to be treated better than that. So I'm going to stand up for myself. I mean, the, the, the entire culture says stand up for yourself. And certainly there's maybe a discussion to be had about that. But the example that Peter's calling us to is the example of Christ. Not what we think is right, not what we think is just, not what we think is fair, but how did Christ conduct himself? Because in verse 21, he says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. The entire book of 1 Peter, if you're not in the mood to grapple with the reality of suffering, 
postpone 1 Peter. Because 1 Peter is about suffering as a follower of Jesus. And Peter is really big, especially in the opening passages of this letter, to talk about the future glory that awaits us. The future hope that we cling to as followers of Jesus. Peter is setting us up for what he says here in chapter 2 to say, keep your eyes fixed on the prize. Keep your eyes fixed on eternity, not on the sufferings of this moment. Saying, look at life with an eternal perspective because we constantly have this battle as followers of Jesus in terms of what fights are we willing to pick? You know, what stances do we insist on taking and what things are we willing to let go of? Because sometimes if we're not careful, we will jump into a fight, a debate, an argument, whatever it is, we will jump into something swinging and just looking to stand our ground, not realizing that in the process, we've lost sight of the big picture. Because what is it that we're here for? We're here to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ and point people to Christ. And sometimes we lose sight of that because I need to win the day now. I need to win this debate. I need to stand firm on this now, even if that means I... I cause someone to say, if that's what Christians are like, I want nothing to do with it. Now, what are those issues that are worth saying, I, I need to take my stand here, and what issues are worth saying, it's more important for me to represent Christ? Those are the issues that you need to work out under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But we need to be mindful of, I can stand up for myself, I can win this moment, but am I forfeiting my witness for Christ? Or is this so essential to what it means to follow Jesus and be a witness for Christ that I need to take my stand here? Those are issues that we need to work through. This is some of the meat of the word that we've been talking about over the past few months. What are those hard-hitting issues that you really need to chew on and wrestle through and, and grapple with? Because Peter says, Christ has set you an example. Christ has set you a pattern that you're to follow. Now, I can sew for emergency purposes. If there's a hole in a pair of sweatpants, I can mend that temporarily. Eventually, my fix is going to unravel and I have to do it all over again. I'm not that skilled with sewing. But sometimes there are issues that we need to follow. If I were to take a pattern for sewing and follow that pattern, I could probably be a lot better. To take that pattern, to take that model, to take that example and do what I'm told to do, things go a lot more smoothly. Jesus has given us the pattern. Jesus gave us the model. We have the gospel account. So there's a lot of times where we don't have to wonder, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus act? Because he shows us. You know, I, oh, sure, Jesus was sinless. He didn't have to deal with difficult people. Pharisees. Very difficult people. Yeah, but Jesus didn't have to deal with hard-headed people. Disciples. Jesus wasn't surrounded by sinful people. Read again. Jesus intentionally surrounded himself with sinful people to the extent that his enemies accused him of being a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, if we wanted Jesus to demonstrate every possible scenario, the Bible would be enormous. But he's given us principles. How do I act? towards someone who doesn't deserve love? How do I show grace to someone who doesn't warrant grace? Jesus exemplifies this, and Peter says, walk in that pattern that Jesus has set for you. He goes on in verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. No matter what, no matter what Jesus faced, no matter what Jesus went through, he committed no sin. And there was never deceit in his mouth. When he was reviled, 
he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued, and here's the key, entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Have you ever read through the Gospels and gotten frustrated with Jesus? Pilate gave Jesus so many opportunities to defend himself to state his case in a way that Pilate would say, okay, yeah, this guy needs to go free. Jesus never says a word. And there are times when you lose sight of the big picture, like, Jesus, why didn't you say something? Because he came to take on the cross. His purpose wasn't to spare his life, but to give his life. Jesus wasn't so caught up in the moment of defending himself that he lost sight of the bigger picture of what he was accomplishing for the kingdom. And so verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Why does Peter include this? It almost seems like a a sharp turn. Like we're talking about, you know, suffering for living like Jesus and just entrusting that to God. But he takes this sharp turn and talks about how Jesus bore our sins in his body. I think at least in part, Because what's at the heart of what Peter's addressing? He's talking about how do you react as a follower of Jesus when somebody acts sinfully towards you? And in that suffering, entrusting yourself to God and maintaining your witness for Christ, you're dealing with somebody who's acted sinfully, and when somebody treats you sinfully, how are we tempted to respond? Sinfully, right? If somebody acts sinfully to us, we want to act sinfully back to them. And so Peter says, remember, Jesus took your sins upon himself. Jesus died because you sinned too. You sinned too. Which means Jesus died for the sins of that person mistreating you as well. For God so loved the world. That includes the horrible boss. That includes the obnoxious neighbor. That includes that person who's constantly just pushing your buttons. That includes the person who treats you worse than anybody else treats you. Jesus died for them, which means Jesus loves them, and Jesus longs to save them too. It calls to mind Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, take the the plank out of your own eye and then you can see clearly to remove the speck from somebody else's eye. Because sometimes when we see somebody else's sins as so egregious, we can justify, well, my sinning back against them isn't as bad because what they did was really bad. Or we can even find ourselves, if we're not careful, living our lives is... We, we see the footprints of Jesus that we're called to walk in. We can spend a lot of our time monitoring the steps of others instead of watching our own steps. And if you look on certain segments of social media, you can find followers of Jesus who are so occupied with pointing out when others don't step in the footprints of Jesus that they don't realize that they have obliterated the footprints themselves. How do we conduct ourselves in the workplace, in our homes, with our family, with our neighbors, with our friends? Because sometimes we, we fall into this American idea that there's sacred and there's secular. There's my church life, my Christian life. That includes what I do Sunday mornings. It includes my quiet times. But sometimes we kind of have those in a bubble. You know, there's my Jesus life here in this bubble, but then there's the rest of my life, and I just live it. 
Following Jesus means that that bubble is burst and everything blends together. That the sacred and the secular are intertwined with one another so that every moment becomes this, I am called to live out Christ in my life. If I'm watching a sporting event with friends, I'm called to walk in the steps of Christ in that moment. If I'm at a holiday dinner with family and there are family members who drive me crazy, I'm still called to follow in the steps of Christ at that dinner table. When my neighbor just constantly, not, not saying my, either of my neighbors are annoying, just it's a common problem that people have. When that neighbor is, makes you want to pull your hair out, you say, I'm called to walk in the steps of Christ with this neighbor or with this coworker. What does that look like for us? What are those places of life where we notice that we have a tendency to react sinfully to people who act sinfully towards us? Or maybe there's one person in particular that just seems to bring out the worst in us. What does it mean for us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus with that person as we interact with them? Now, again, there, there's a point where there's boundaries. If somebody is, uh, there's a difference between putting up with somebody abusing you and just being mean to them or just creating a safe boundary for yourself. That, that, that's, I don't want to diminish that aspect. But in all of it, what does it mean to still walk in the footsteps of Jesus? How do I conduct myself in such a way that yeah, I'm not opening myself up for unnecessary abuse, but at the same time, I'm modeling Christ and pointing that person to Jesus. Maybe there's a particular scenario, a particular person that comes to mind that this per my life would be so much smoother if this person just moved way far away. What does it mean to reflect Jesus and walk in the footsteps of Jesus in that relationship? I can't spell that out for you, but the Holy Spirit can. The Holy Spirit can show you what does it mean because he's the one who's going to give you the power to do it. What does it mean for you to walk in the footsteps of Jesus? Now, again, I always want to be careful with my wording Remember, there are times when Jesus simply removed himself from a hostile crowd. So there's a conversation to be had there. But what does it look like for us? With that situation, that person who seems to bring out the worst in us, what does it look like, what does it mean for us to walk after the pattern of Jesus, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus? How would Jesus act toward that person in that situation if Jesus was living my life. 1896, Charles Sheldon wondered, what would it look like for a community to ask that question? Maybe in 2023, it's not an outdated question. What would it look like? Not to wear a wristband, not that there's anything wrong with those, but not, not to make a marketing gimmick out of it or just be flippant about the question, but to honestly soul wrestle with what does it look like for me in this scenario to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Let's pray.